A very common operation that we'll come across with deep learning is convolution. We're going to explore what this means using our new Gaussian kernel that we've just created. For now, just think of it as a way of filtering information. We're going to effectively filter an image using this Gaussian function as if the Gaussian function is the lens through which we'll see our image data. What it will do is at every location we tell it to filter the image, it will average the image values around it based on what the kernel's values are. The Gaussian's kernel is basically saying, take a lot of the center and then decreasingly less and less as you go farther away from the center. The effect of convolving the image with this type of kernel is that the entire image will be blurred. If you would like an interactive exploration of convolution, this website is great. Let's first load an image. We're going to need a grayscale image to begin with, and Scikit image has some images that we can play with. If you don't have the Scikit image module, you can load your own image or get Scikit image by pip installing Scikit image. So I'll just grab the cameraman image. And I'm going to cast that to float32. Let's have a look at this image. Great. And what's the shape? OK. So notice our image is two-dimensional. When we perform convolution in TensorFlow, we'll need our images to be four-dimensional. And remember that when we load many images and combine them into a single NumPy array, the resulting image has a shape of number of images, then height, then width, then channels. In order to perform 2D convolution with TensorFlow, we'll need the same dimensions for our image. With just one grayscale image, this means that the shape will be 1 by h by w by 1. We could use the NumPy reshape function to reshape our NumPy array. Reshape. But since we'll be using TensorFlow, we can actually use the TensorFlow reshape function like so. Instead of getting a NumPy array back, we get a TensorFlow tensor. This means that we can't access the shape parameter like we did with the NumPy array, but instead we can use get shape and get shape as list. The height by width image is now part of a four dimensional array where the other dimensions of n and c are one. So there's only one image and only one channel. We'll also have to reshape our Gaussian kernel to be four-dimensional as well. And the dimensions for kernels are slightly different. Remember that the image is shaped by n, by height, by width, by channels. This is for images. For a convolution kernel, we'll need the height of the kernel times the width of the kernel times the image channels times the number of convolution filters. For now, we'll stick with just one kernel as output. But we'll see how this comes into play in later sessions. So our kernel already has a height and width of k size. So we'll stick with that for now. The number of input channels should match the number of channels on the image we want to convolve. So for now, we'll just keep the same number of output channels as the input channels, but later we'll see how this comes into play. We can now use our previous Gaussian kernel to convolve an image. 
Let's create an operation which will do this. So there are two new parameters here, strides and padding. Strides say how to move our kernel across the image. And basically, we'll only ever use it for one of two sets of parameters. One by one by one by one basically says how to move across the number of images, the height of images, the width of the image, and the number of channels. Or one by two by two by one which says that we're going to skip every other pixel in our image array and convolve every other pixel. This has the effect of downsampling the image. Padding says what to do at the borders. If we say same, that means we want the same dimensions going in as going out. In order to do this, zeros are padded around the image. If we say valid, that means no padding is used and the image dimensions will actually change. Let's have a look at the result of our convolution. Matplotlib can't handle plotting 40 images, so we'll have to convert them back to the original shape, height by width. And there are a few ways that we could do this. We could plot by squeezing the singleton dimensions, or we could specify the exact dimensions that we want to visualize. We've now seen how to use TensorFlow to create a set of operations, which create a two-dimensional Gaussian kernel, and how to use that kernel to filter or convolve another image. Let's create another interesting convolutional kernel called a Gabor. This is a lot like the Gaussian kernel, except we use a sine wave to modulate it. So we're going to draw a 1D Gaussian wave. We've seen what the Gaussian looks like. And we're just going to modulate that by a second function, a sine wave. And the sine wave is going to look like, like that. The resulting wave is going to look like a modulated Gaussian, where part of it comes up and part of it comes down. We first use linspace to get a set of values the same range as our Gaussian, which should be from minus 3 standard deviations to positive 3 standard deviations. We'll then calculate the sign of these values, which should give us a nice wave. And for multiplication, we'll need to convert this one dimensional vector to a matrix, n by 1. We can then repeat this wave across the matrix by using a multiplication of ones. We can directly multiply our old Gaussian kernel by this wave and get the Gabor kernel. So we've already gone through the work of convolving an image. And the only thing that's changed is the kernel that we want to convolve with. 
We could have made life a lot easier by specifying in our graph which elements we wanted to be specified later. And TensorFlow calls these placeholders, meaning we're not sure what these are yet, but we know they'll fit into the graph like so. Generally, these are the input and output of the network. Let's rewrite our convolution operation using a placeholder for the image and the kernel. And then we'll see how the same operation could have been done. We're going to set the image dimensions to none by none. This is something special for placeholders, which tells TensorFlow, let this dimension be any possible value. One, five, hundred, thousand, doesn't matter. This is a placeholder which will become part of the TensorFlow graph, but which we'll have to later explicitly define whenever we run or evaluate the graph. And pretty much everything you do in TensorFlow can have a name. If we didn't specify the name, TensorFlow would have given it a default one, like placeholder underscore zero. So we use a more useful name to just help us understand what's happening. We'll reshape the 2D image to a 3D tensor just like before, Except now, we'll make use of another TensorFlow function, expandDIMS, which adds a singleton dimension at the axis we specify. We use it to reshape our height by width image to include a channel dimension of 1. And so our new dimensions will be, end up being height by width by 1. And again, to get a 1 by height by width by 1, we can expand dims on the zeroth axis. Let's create another set of placeholders for our Gabor's parameters. And then finally, we'll redo the entire set of operations we've done to convolve our image, except now with our placeholders. And finally, we'll convolve the two. What we've done is create an entire graph from our placeholders, which is capable of convolving an image with the Gabor kernel. In order to compute it, we'll have to specify all of the placeholders required for its computation. If we try to evaluate it without specifying placeholders beforehand, we'll get an error, invalid argument error. You must feed a value for a placeholder tensor image with the destination type float and a shape 512 by 512. It's saying that we didn't specify our placeholder for image. In order to feed a value, we'll use the feed underscore dict parameter, like so. But that's not the only placeholder in our graph. So it's still complaining that we didn't specify a value for mean with d type float. When I specify all of the placeholders, we get our result, and I can show the image. So now instead of specifying every value beforehand, we can just specify the different placeholders, and the graph will compute everything as if that value had changed.